Okay, well, we're going to start for the second day um, and we're going to open, first of all, with Elisa Barwick and she's going to be speaking about Venice's cultural war warfare against the Renaissance. Okay, this is Elisa, thank you. And Elisa's one of the phone team if people are not familiar with who she is. How is the universe composed? How is it directed? Is it composed from the bottom up, from pieces and parts to form a whole? Is it directed by the mass of individual activity, the effects of which define or direct the whole? All the little working, whizzing cogs that compose the whole machine? Or is there some top-down controlling mechanism which orders the whole in all of its parts? <coughs> I want you to have a look at this animation. You can see up the top 10 million light years away from the Milky Way. And we're going to be moving in, if you can start, Jeremy an order of, order of magnitude closer, one million light years. Our galaxy, the Milky Way. Stars at the rim of the Milky Way galaxy. Stars in the Milky Way galaxy. A hundred light years from Earth and nothing but stars. And more stars at ten light years from Earth. The sun is the brightest star at one light year. The sun is growing larger. The solar system from 100 billion kilometres away. Our solar system. Orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars and Jupiter. Parts of the orbits of Venus, Earth and Mars. <coughs> Part of the Earth's orbit. the Earth and the orbit of the Moon, the Earth from 100,000 kilometres, the Western Hemisphere of the Earth, Southeastern United States, Leon, Wakula and Franklin counties in Florida, Southwest Tallahassee, Florida, the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, nearby trees, the lake and the laboratory roof, top of large oak tree, <laughs> oak tree branch with leaves, <laughs> stay with me, <laughs> oak tree leaves at actual size, surface of an oak leaf magnified 10 times, surface of an oak leaf magnified 100 times, cells on the leaf surface, individual leaf cells, the nucleus of a leaf cell, <coughs> chromatin in the leaf cell nucleus, individual DNA strands, DNA nucleotide building blocks, outer electron cloud of a carbon atom, electron in the inner electron shell, empty space between inner shell and nucleus, <coughs> nucleus viewed beneath the electron shells, Nucleus of the carbon atom and face to face with a single proton. <coughs> LaRouche regularly cites Einstein's conception, particularly inspired by Kepler and his discovery of gravitation, that the universe is finite but unbounded. 
Each finite moment of that universe is defined by universal physical principles, directing the universe as if from the outside. The shadow of those principles is to be found everywhere in the universe, from the largest to the smallest cross-section. Leibniz called this the infinitesimal. One of Leibniz's enemies, the mathematician Leonard Euler, tried to reduce this idea to a metric mathematical smallness and denied the ex existence of the actual infinitesimal because you can never get to it. You can always reduce things down to something smaller. This is called infinite divisibility. Just go to the previous one, Jeremy. Just leave it there. Now, thinking back to our anim animation, that sort of does seem to be the case, doesn't it? You can always go smaller. But think about the way Euler is looking at dividing up the composition of the universe made up of parts as compared to Leibniz. Euler said, all extension or matter is divisible to infinity. See, in his view, linear extension, the length of something, defines substance, and we'll be looking more at that later with Zarpi. But let me give you an example of Euler's method. If I want to walk across the room to uh, shake Darren Hartnett's hand, first I have to go halfway, right? Okay, but if I want to get to the halfway point, say Nick Contarini, to get to Nick, I've got to go halfway to Nick. I've got to get to just in front of Jim Hazard's feet. But if I want to get halfway to Jim Hazard's feet, I'm going to get halfway to his feet. I'm going to get halfway to that point first. So I'm going to have to get to somewhere down there. But to get to that point, I've got to get halfway there first, don't I? Am I ever gonna? Am I ever gonna get there? Am I ever gonna get to shake Darren's hand? <laughs> That's why I never have. <laughs> if you look at the universe, if you look at matter as being an infinite division of linear extension in that way, you. It, the world, the universe, does not work that way. That's called Zeno's paradox, that particular example. Um, another example is the square root of 2. Does anyone know what the square root of 2 is off the top of their head? 1.4. blah, blah, blah. If you had to give me the exact length, cut out a piece of paper to that exact length, could you do it? <laughs> We've got people ahead of, ahead of me. Um, if, yeah, if you wanted to find it with a ruler, right, would you ever find it if you had to measure out that length using this method that Euler and the same method that Zeno's paradox typifies? Because it's, it's not um, square root of 2, it's not like the square root of 16 or the square root of 4 that's a whole number, it's a recurring decimal point. And it's when you keep trying to hone in on it, on that number line and then enlarge your number line and you honing in on it a bit more, enlarge the number line, honing in, you're going to keep getting an extra decimal point to get more and more precise. But as someone just said, if you want to actually find the square root of negative 2, you can do it in an instant. It's that diagonal line of a square this being a square of area 1. How do I know that that's the square root of 2? Next slide, please. The first square, the little one in the bottom left corner, that's my square here. So if I've defined that as a square of area 1, the second middle square, which is on an angle, is double the first square. So it's an area of 2. What's the 
side of a square the area of 2? Square root of 2. The, the, well, the side of a square of 2 has to be the square root of 2, right? So you can see in the second square that that length, which is the diagonal of the first square, has to be the square root of 2. And, you know, if, if anyone, does everyone see fairly clearly why the second? Oh, um, yeah, possibly. But I don't need it urgently whenever it gets found. <laughs> um, yeah, you can see, right, why the second square is double the first one. Because that's another little proof in and of itself, which I'm not going to go through. That's the, the Mino dialogue. But um, just for people's, you know, how do, how do we know that this is the case? The first little square in the corner is made up of how many triangles? And the second, the second square is made up of four triangles of the same same size, exactly. So we know that the second square is double the first one. We know that the length of the edge of the second square has to be the square root of 2, which is the diagonal of our first square. So therefore, you know, we can find that magnitude, but you're not going to find it in the way that, um, that Euler's method dictates. You're not going to find it by linear extension. The same way you're not going to cross the room if you think about it in the way that Zeno thought about it, of dividing things in half, half again, half again. So, the, the square root of 2 cannot be obtained by any other method other than generation by the principle of squaring. So you can always go smaller, as we saw in our animation, and even when the limit is reached, as in the end of the animation, with more powerful microscopes, etc., we can eventually go even smaller still, no doubt. But as opposed to the Euler method of simple linear extension, let's think about extending our investigation into the very small in another way. Think of the macrocosm rather than the microcosm for a moment. Instead of dividing down, chopping up, Go in the opposite direction to the heavens, as in the animation at the beginning. Think about the principles that order the orbits of the planets in our solar system. What do we know from Kepler, for example? What kind of things determine where and how the planets orbit? Got some Kepler, budding Kepler students here. <laughs> That's right the harmonic ratios between the orbits, gravitation, of course, the distance of the planets from the sun. There's a whole series of, of things that uh, play into the creation of where the orbits are and why they are where they are. Now, apply that type of thinking to the small. Apply those bounding principles, those harmonies, in the reverse direction. Singularities are not generated by division, by linear extension, but by the action of principles, as we saw with the square root of 2. Or, you know, you can take the simple example of a circle and folding a circle to create a line and a point. The rotational action represents the principle of least action which creates that singularity. But the mathematicians would say, no, that has an independent existence. It's not the intersection of, it's not the creation of a singularity created by higher principles. The singularities we find when we go smaller and smaller are shadows of the higher bounding principle of organisation which is not visible to the senses. As Lyndon LaRouche put it in one of his papers, the smallness of the Leibniz infinitesimal is the limitlessly infinitesimal expression of a shadow of the action of an infinite, example, limitless, universal physical principle. 
In other words, the infinitesimal is a shadow of the action of a limitless universal physical principle. So you can't see the principle itself, you can only see its shadow. The characteristic of action of that organising principle is to be found everywhere we look because it's universal. So yes, you can keep going smaller and smaller, but you will always find the expression of the same universal principles wherever you look, whichever division you make. In the microcosm, when you're looking you know, in your microscope, it's like you're slicing into the universe to find, even in the tiniest cross-section, the exact same principle which is evident in the very large, in the macrocosm, in the astronomic scale. You can see here that harmonic ordering principles such as the platonic solids define both the astronomic and microscopic domains. That's Kepler's diagram of uh, where he put the platonic solids between the planets and showed that that corresponded. And the next gra uh, graphic is a close-up of the inner part of that, showing various of the platonic solids defining the astronomic scale. And then the following one is uh, is a calcium, is it 20 calcium 40, which the intersection of the parallel faces of an icosahedron, one of the platonic solids, are uh, where the protons of that element exist. So we're not going to go into that in any detail, but just to give you an example that that ordering is everywhere. Next, please. The universe is inherently creative. That's it. <coughs> As if dominated by a creative intention, which is expressed in a harmonic way. The universe is thereby organised and appears to us in a harmonic fashion, in harmonic intervals or divisions, just like the musical scale. The easiest example to visualise is Kepler's harmony of the spheres, which we just saw a depiction of. Now I'm going to play two quick clips for you of uh, Sky Shields, who's part of the Lim basement crew in the United States, because their work, I mean, this subject is something that LaRouche and the basement and our whole organisation has looked at for many years, but their recent work on cosmic, cosmic radiation has, I know, yielded a lot of light on the subject for me. So I think it's useful to listen to these two clips. The first one you can bring up is um, just two minutes. The next slide, yep. Well, we're going to be launching, in fact, a, a, a very harsh and a very detailed attack on this positivist, the positivist approach in the physical sciences, but then also more broadly. And one of the central pieces right now is going to be revisiting that conception of this question of what is matter, so revisiting the debate that took place between Einstein and Bohr, and continuing the work that Einstein was doing, the, his understanding of causality from the standpoint of, of, uh, of this, you know, we say cosmic radiation, but as Lynn's been saying, LaRouche has been saying, what you mean is harmonics, where you're looking at what are the principles that exist not as discrete points throughout the universe, but exist as universal principles, which act everywhere in the universe as though at once. And then to begin with that, to begin with that is your model for causality, because that's the way, that is the way principles interact. And then to see their shadow as generated singularities that you call matter. The things you call particles, these are, these are not things that have an actual discrete existence. They're singularities that are formed as the intersection of large-scale harmonic wave-like properties, wave-like uh, phenomena. And if you can begin to, to reclaim that idea, suddenly you realize that if, if that's your view of the universe, if the universe functions in that way, which we're familiar with, by the way living creatures interact, by the way, uh, uh, human society functions and human ideas work. These are all. This is. These are the physics of human ideas. Okay, and we've got a second clip, which is four minutes, 
from also Sky speaking on Off the Cuff. You've got a universe as a whole, which is fundamentally creative. It reflects as a whole the, the, the quality of creativity that, that you, would, you would use to characterize an artistic composition or a scientific discovery. And that that creativity, that fundamental creativity, that is what gives you the development, evolutionary development of the biosphere, the formation of planets, the formation of stars. Uh, but that this is a top-down process in the exact same way as any other creative process, compositional process is, that there's a single idea that governs this process. There's mm -hmm. an intention in the universe. And that everything else that you look at that seems to exist within that is a singularity that's generated by the way that process intersects with itself. Mm -hmm. You don't have any object per se that exists in the universe. Right. Any more than you could say, than you could say that the, the line that comes, that comes into existence when you cross two planes together has an independent existence. Mm -hmm. It exists as an intersection. The process that created it is what's real. It, as an object, is only a shadow. Mm -hmm. And recognizing that in this project, this cosmic ray project, in the physical sciences, gives us a methodological approach that also is to apply to be applied to society in a much broader sense, in a much more developed sense. Yeah. Now, just to hone in a little bit on what you're developing more, it reminds me to, uh, tonight one of the things he was discussing was specifically with regard to the cosmic ray investigation was the uh, the role of the the weaker forces, the weaker powers, as he. Uh, depicted it tonight with regard to the cosmic rays, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just say something about that. This is important. The place where you can see, sort of your indicator of, of it, this, it harkens back to the work that Leibniz did with the infinitesimal, mm -hmm. the philosophical idea of the infinitesimal, not the not the, the, the mathematical concept of it. Is there which, a difference? Yeah, which I'll give. This is the, the the real question here. Well, what do you mean to say that uh, that in the infinitesimal you find a principle? Mm -hmm. In a sense, it's true. You take a living organism. You say at, at the time an organism is alive, there's no portion of that organism, no matter how small, which is not taking part in that living process. Right. But that's not because it's composed of incredibly tiny living parts. It's because the principle of life that organizes it pervades the process as a whole. Right. So your, your statement of saying the statement that a principle exists in the infinitesimal is the same as stating that that principle is universal, mm -hmm. that it exists throughout the process. Right. Uh, and so in this case, and you realize that, that realizing that the ability for something to exist qualitatively in the very, very small into the infinitesimally small at the point where you've got no more object, mm -hmm. at that point you've only got principle. Right. If you carry that over into this broader investigation of, uh, of, of cosmic radiation, you find the exact same thing. You find that these things, uh, you know, what's, what's typically discarded in the sorts of investigation, you know, energy levels, uh, uh, intensities of electromagnetic radiation that, you know, you're, the idiot discards as being too small and too weak to have an effect. Right. You suddenly realize because of their qualitative character mm -hmm. are the most effective process in the whole universe. So, I've got some pretty profound work going on there. But as he said, when you get so small into the infinitesimal that there's basically no matter left, all that remains is principle. And that's what we're looking at today. Uh, the next graphic, as LaRouche once put it, the infinitesimal is the expression of the limitless upon the most limited. And I think of our sense perceptions as the most limited. <laughs> yeah. So what does this have to do with classical art? The beauty and effect of Renaissance art stemmed from the ontological idea of the infinitesimal implicit in the work of Nicholas of Cusa though not thoroughly elaborated until Leibniz. Cusa was a German philosopher and scientist and a cardinal in the Catholic Church. Lyndon LaRouche hails Cusa as the founder of modern science. Cusa made breakthroughs in physical geometry, which overturned the Aristotelian Euclidean methods of formal geometry. 
But the, crucial, the most crucial thing about him was that he was really the first to rigorously identify and explain the functioning of universal physical principles as the basis of anything and everything in the entire universe. He looked beyond the domain of the senses to the realm of principles which direct and bound the universe, the metaphysical domain. The squaring of the circle, as we'll see later, is a perfect example of the way that he did this and how he conveyed it. This is primarily a class on art, but it could not be done without looking at the scientific advancements that encompassed the minds of the many artists who were part of Kuz's circles. Hopefully you will see by the end of this class that art and science cannot be separated. Classical artistic culture is the wellspring which encourages creativity within a culture. The ability to imagine and hypothesise in science is activated by the arts, as we have seen in the case of Einstein. It is only when you have your imagination stirred that you become creative. Archimedes' proof of the quadrature of the circle which was when he, he supposedly proved that you could create a circle starting with a triangle, increasing the sides to a square, and as the polygon had more and more sides, it became closer and closer to a circle. That proof of Archimedes was based upon two propositions in Euclid's elements. Those propositions reflect the Eudoxian method of exhaustion used by Archimedes. Now, Cusa dissected and destroyed those methods of geometry. He showed up the inconsistencies within their system of geometry. As you try to square the circle, you might have to click again. Oh, no. Go back. Okay. As you try to square the circle, you discover you can keep adding sides forever. But you never get there because you can always add more sides. Now what we have, when you zero in on it, when you get out your microscope and check if it's a circle, is you actually find that there's a discontinuity. No matter how many more sides you add, there will always be a discontinuity, a gap between that polygon and the circle, a gap which can never be bridged. This is because you are trying to approximate the existence of a higher ontological species, circular action, from the domain of a lower species, linear extension. So not only did Cusa demolish the existing mathematics, he made a higher level point out of his demonstration, the incommensurability between rectilinear magnitudes and a circle. Now, Cusa goes on to, you can go to the next slide and just leave it on that. Cusa develops a metaphor out of this. The circle is a true infinite. It does not admit of greater or less, as does the polygon. It transcends the polygon. It cannot be broken down. It is not infinitely divisible, as Cusa's opponents believed all magnitudes to be. A polygon is created and hence finite, and it cannot precisely attain the truth itself, which is infinite. I'm going to read a quote from Cusa about this, slowly so that you can hopefully follow it. Cusa's very challenging, so hopefully you're all awake. Next, please. This is from Learned Ignorance. Cusa says, Therefore, it is not the case that by means of likenesses, a finite intellect can precisely attain the truth about things. For truth is not something more or something less, but is something indivisible. Whatever is not truth cannot measure truth precisely. By comparison, a non-circle cannot measure a circle 
whose being is something indivisible. Hence, the intellect, which is not truth, never comprehends truth so precisely that truth cannot be comprehended infinitely more precisely. For the intellect is to truth as an inscribed polygon is to the inscribing circle. The more angles the inscribed polygon has, the more similar it is to the circle. However, even if the number of its angles is increased ad infinitum, the polygon never becomes equal to the circle unless it is resolved into an identity with the circle. The circle is a bounding principle in terms of space. It orders the polygons within it, like a universal physical principle which bounds and orders the universe. The discontinuity that we saw between the circle and the polygons is the shadow of that ordering principle, an infinitesimal. Now we're going to take another example to demonstrate this. And, and this is another example of how the infinitesimal comes up in Kuz's work, even though he didn't call it that. The maximum minimum principle. Now just to remember, Kuza just described in this section how the measure and the measured can never be equal. So what you're using to measure and what you're measuring can never be equal because they can always become progressively more similar. But Kuza says that truth cannot be either something more or something less. So truth is outside of that measure and measured. Truth is something that cannot be more or less. So if it cannot be more, it is maximum. And if it cannot be less, it is minimum. Hmm. So truth is at once both of those things. Kuzer establishes that the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum are identical. If we have the next quote, again from Learned Ignorance, and this one's even harder to follow, but stay with me, I'll hopefully explain it. Um, since the absolutely maximum is all that which can be, it is altogether actual. And just as there cannot be a greater, so for the same reason there cannot be a lesser, since it is all that which can be. But the minimum is that than which there cannot be a lesser. And since the maximum is also such, it is evident that the minimum coincides with the maximum. The foregoing point will become clearer to you if you contract maximum and minimum to quantity. For maximum quantity is maximally large and minimum quantity is maximally small. Therefore, if you free maximum and minimum from quantity by, removing, by mentally removing large and small, you will see clearly that maximum and minimum coincide. See that clearly? <laughs> right, think about it this way. This is how I was trying to envision it. You know, you know those old TVs where you've got a volume button before you had remote controls? <laughs> so picture that volume button. Um, okay, so you've got the, you know, however long the bar is and you can move it from the, slide it up, yeah, from the bottom to the top. Okay, so in your mind, you've slid it all the way up to the top. It's the maximum, right? Now, because it's maximum, you can't add more. That's it. It doesn't go any further. Now, because it's maximum, you can't go less because we've said it's maximum. We've got the maximum, right? So you can't go less. Now, what do we call that which you can't go less of? Minimum. The minimum, right? So you can't go more because it's maximum, but you can't go down because we've said it's the maximum. So it's the maximum and it's the minimum. So you have to abstract your thinking a little bit. 
because we're going outside the realm of the senses. I mean, even though you use those little <laughs> images to try to picture it, but we're trying to go outside the senses here to think of, you know, pure ideas. Absolute maximality or minimality is infinite. The maximum and minimum are transcendent terms of absolute signification so that in their absolute simplicity they encompass beyond all contraction to quantity or uh, to quantity of mass or quantity of power all things. That's in Kuz's words again. Just like a bounding principle in the small and the large i.e. the infinitesimal. Here's another example of the maximum minimum principle in the next slide. The maximum possible circle is a straight line. How about that? <laughs> you can see starting from the smaller circle in the middle, HG, that as the circle gets bigger to FE and DC, its actual curvature gets less. So the maximum circle is minimally curved. The two coincide. Kuzer goes on to use the infinite circle as a metaphor for how a universal principle, also known as an infinitesimal or maximal minimal, operates. He says that because the circumference, centre and diameter of the circle are all infinite, they coincide. He says, as you can read up here, you see that because the centre is infinite, the whole of the maximum is present most perfectly within everything as the simple and the indivisible. Moreover, it is outside of every being, surrounding all things, because the circumference is infinite, and penetrating all things, because the diameter is infinite. So it's within everything, it's outside of everything, and it's surrounding everything, and it's penetrating everything. It is the beginning of all things because it is the centre. It is the end of all things because it is the circumference. It is the middle of all things because it is the diameter. It is the efficient cause since it is the centre. It is the formal cause since it is the diameter. It is the final cause since it is the circumference. This is exactly how LaRouche describes an infinitesimally present universal physical principle. It's everywhere and it's causal. Cusa has blown away Aristotle's law of contradictions that contradictory statements cannot both at the same time be true in one fell swoop. He says the maximum precedes all opposition since it somehow embraces and enfolds all things. Now, with that background of Cusa, let's look at some of the other key figures in Cusa's circle. One crucial figure in the Renaissance who preceded Cusa was the architect and engineer Filippo Brunelleschi. He made crucial scientific advancements such as that typified by the construction of the dome at the church of San Santa Maria del Fiore. In the picture, the, this cathedral was begun in 1296 but no one had any idea how to construct such a massive dome until around 1418 when Brunelleschi was given the commission. It was completed in 1436. To build the cupola, Brunelleschi had to discover, apply and communicate a form of the universal principle of least action. He looked at space as a manifold of principles rather than empty space. He used a physical rather than a formal geometry. Abstract geomet geometrical concepts could not build his dome. A physically defined principle, the catenary, was the key. Likewise, the science of perspective concerned the principles bounding the visual domain. The idea of a horizon, a singularity created on the canvas, unleashed a revolution in the science of perspective. It is a transfinite. While pertaining to finite things, it is a lever to the infinite. You're bringing the infinite onto a flat piece of paper, so you've got to have a means to do that. Brunelleschi made important contributions to the science of perspective. Leon Battista Alberti supplied the technical know-how and geometrical skill to put this into the form of geometrical rules of perspective, 
for example, in his Della Pittura. Piero della Francesca was one of the main practitioners of these advances in perspective. And there's another one, yep. That's Piero on the left there in another example of his art. But the most important and profound perspective advances were made by Leonardo da Vinci. He took his lead from Cusa, who knew all of the players I've just mentioned and more. In his On the Summit of Vision, Cusa looked at the crucial role of light, which was picked up in great detail by Leonardo in his manuscripts. Cusa pointed out that there is no vision without light, nor colour. The more clearly something represents the light, the more noble and beautiful it is. Yet the light itself is invisible. In his Prospettiva, which means perspective, or in Leonardo's Italian, optics, Leonardo defines the science of vision as the key to art. This picture here was a painting by Leonardo's teacher, Verrocchio, The Baptism of Christ. That's just a, a small section of it. But the angel on the right was painted by Verrocchio and the angel on the left was painted by Leonardo. And I reckon you can really see the difference between the two angels. Not that the one on the right is not good, but the one on the left has this almost ethereal quality. And if you read Leonardo's writings, when he talks about um, perspective of colour and blurring things out in the background, he talks about how the surfaces of things have no existence. It's just a meeting of two. That surface is the meeting of, between the air and the person. And he, therefore, you can hardly see the lines dividing the background from the angel's hair, the face, the, the edges of that figure are far more subtle than Verrocchio's angel. A physical rather than a formal perspective took shape. Space rather than an empty place is a field of interaction. The principles defined by Leonardo create the appearance of our seeing truth rather than just reality. Leonardo proves that artistic beauty and scientific knowledge are one. Raphael made his own advances in perspective, though not in a written form. His application of an advanced spherical perspective, however, is obvious in his work. You can show the next graphic. Raphael imagined his figures as if projected onto the negatively curved inside of a sphere, which you see in the next representation of it. The problem with all the perspective up until Leonardo is that it only allowed the object to be viewed from a single viewpoint. You had to stand exactly in the right spot to get the effect of the perspective. But with Leonardo and Raphael, you can look at the painting from any angle and the pers perspective will work. It was paradoxes, particularly in ancient man's observations of the apparent positions of the planets and stars, which first led man to discoveries of principles. We saw that yesterday in Robbie's class. Kepler put it this way. He said that we assume the planets move in circles, but when experience is seen to teach something different to those who pay careful attention, namely that the planets deviate from a simple circular path, it gives rise to a powerful sense of wonder, which at length drives men to look into causes. Kepler only discovered gravitation by the paradoxical juxtaposition between sight and harmonics. Sight associated with vision, harmonics associated with hearing. LaRouche applies this principle to poetry, music and art. When faced with such a paradox, LaRouche says, the idea exists apparently solely in the gap in the discontinuity which the contradictory feature of the conjunction situates. The idea occurs as a demonstrably efficient solution existing outside either of the conjoined elements for the paradox posed by the conjunction. The discovery of an empirically validated universal physical principle is the archetype of such solutions to such forms of paradox. The point to be emphasised is that all artistic ideas are of exactly the same form 
as the discovery of an experimentally validated universal physical principle. Think back to the squaring of the circle. The gap, the discontinuity, gives something away. This infinitesimal gap betrays the existence of a principle. Wherever we see a paradox, there could be a principle lurking. Let's see how this principle works in art. I've just got a series of examples here to quickly go through. And th these are some of the earlier ones. You can keep going. Uh, we see the perspective is still not quite figured out. We'll just keep going through them, just a few moments to look at them. Again, this is still some of the earlier Renaissance art to Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, we're going to zero in on this painting by Raphael Sanzio called the Alba Madonna. Hopefully everyone can see that okay. Raphael purposefully created paradoxes in this painting so as to self-consciously provoke certain specific ideas in the viewer. Even for example at the outset why do you think he made the painting round when by far the majority of paintings are rectangular? What other paradoxes do you see in this picture? And you have to look at it. Can everyone see it fairly clearly or? Oh, um, maybe the lights off might help a little bit. <coughs> Yeah, the spherical curvature, as we talked about earlier, is really obvious in this one. It's, yeah, it's almost three-dimensional, the way that it looks. When you begin to, you know, and obviously we haven't got all day, but when you spend some time looking at this painting, and obviously it's the case with all of the Renaissance art, but in this one particular, there's a number of things you begin to wonder, why did he do that? Like for example, why the, because you've got Mary, Jesus is the, the baby, uh, even that, you know, he's not a, an infant and yet Raphael's drawn him naked, which is an interesting paradox because he looks like he's probably three, two or three years old at least. Um, and then you've got St. John the Baptist, which they're both holding on to this. St. John the Baptist was a, a shepherd, so he's holding on to a shepherd's staff, but the, it, Raphael has not depicted the usual shepherd's staff with a crook. It's a cross. Why has he put a cross on the end of the staff? Have a look at the, um, the direction of the, the gaze of the various participants, if you can see it well enough hopefully and, and later you can have a look, it's up on the wall in the um, dining room, some of you might have seen it already. Why do you think Mary and John are looking at the cross but Jesus is looking at John? You've also got the motion of Jesus moving away from Mary towards John and the cross as Mary is closing the book and you've got John, he's actually got an armful of flowers in, in his arms there but he's also, he's clutching onto the, you can see it more clearly in the one down there later but he's clutching onto that staff or that cross quite tightly as well as if he's 
almost pulling it back, pulling it away from Jesus. Anyone got any thoughts they want to throw out there? <coughs> or any other paradoxes you might have noticed? It looks like there's no motion in the room. Hmm. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, it's a fixed painting. It's, there's no motion. And yet it's mid, it's mid motion, isn't it? It's as if you've just captured a moment. Jesus is pretty muscly, isn't it? <laughs> Only one leg. <laughs> one leg. Yeah, but Jesus looks um, intelligent, like, but the paradox is uh, he should have clothes on. Mm. Know, if he's got a, he kind of looks like he's the controlling thing. Mm -hmm. Yep, and yet, you know, the idea of not having clothes on, you know, really is associated with complete innocence of a tiny baby that, you know, no one feels embarrassed to see a tiny baby without clothes on, right? But to see someone that's older is a different story. Um, so I'll go through a few of the ideas that I had, which are by no means conclusive. <laughs> it looks like he's in charge. Yeah, our, his, his look, the look in his <coughs> eye, definitely, I'll, I'll talk about this. He, I think that the combination of the cross, did you want to, yeah? <coughs> One contradiction I notice is that he's portrayed the two children mm -hmm. as miniature adults as opposed to children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually that's interesting because that does fit in with what I'm thinking. I hadn't thought of that one. Um, Look, generally, and we'll talk about it more in the course of this class, Raphael was a part of the networks of Cusa. And um, as we'll see a little bit later, there was obviously a, a political situation that they were intervening in with their art. And that'll become far more clear. But just to, and that's very important, because we are, we're looking into Raphael's mind. We're, we're not trying to think, how do I interpret this. We're saying, why, what was Raphael thinking? What was, why was he portraying it this way? Why was he specifically provoking our thinking by putting forward certain paradoxes? Um, I think the combination of the cross and the fact that Mary and John the Baptist are looking at the cross, but, but Jesus is looking at John the Baptist, this brings Christ's future into the painting. Both Mary and John seem to be anticipating the crucifixion of Christ by looking at the cross. But they do not have the same look in their eyes as Jesus himself. Jesus looks at John as if he sees all. He looks with faith and confidence. Perhaps seeing the role John was to play, announcing the Messiah to the world. Perhaps seeing John as representative of all mankind who he has come to redeem. Perhaps merely to say, I don't fear death, represented by the cross, and nor should you, because death is not the end. The cross, the, the presence of that cross on the staff, sets the curvature of the lives of all three participants in the painting. It brings the future into their present moment. So again, this is another form of motion, even though it's, a, it's an actual, just a moment in their lives that's been depicted, it's bringing the future, the past, right into that moment. Now Mary has closed her book and Jesus turns towards John. He is in motion between his mother and the cross, as if between his birth and his death, the boundaries of physical life. Is he taking the first step away from Mary towards his destiny? If so, he is not afraid. John clings to the staff which he looks upon with furtive eyes as if to keep it away from his younger cousin. Jesus, however, gently takes the cross, his index finger pointing towards heaven. He is completely calm. <coughs> Despite all this going on, this profound and intense dialogue between three voices, the overall scene is one of immense serenity, another paradox. It is also possible that Mary is holding, as would have been typical, the Old Testament. She is closing this book as Christ, moving forward towards his destiny, literally opens a new book in the history of mankind. 
All of these ideas and many more, no doubt, converge on a single unified idea, that of the painting. The painting encompasses all time, bringing together the past, the present and the future. It portrays the circle of life from birth to death, but then simultaneously the existence of something beyond death, immortality, or temporal eternity, an idea later famously depicted by Raphael's School of Athens, where he shows great thinkers who lived thousands of years apart dialoguing in the same room. If man is more than his physical being, if he is the ideas he discovers and conveys, then that lives on for all time. This is what Christ, depicted in the painting, sees, which is conveyed by the look in his eyes. <coughs> Thinking back to Cousa's metaphor of the circle, I think this is probably why Raphael chose to make his painting in that shape, like the principle bounding the lives of the three characters and of us all. So here we have the essence of what classical art is all about. We have a whole series of profound ideas, none of which are explicitly in the painting itself. Christ dying on the cross is not actually depicted or you know, drawn there anywhere, and yet it dominates the entire work of art. Raphael is provoking you to think about these ideas and apply them to your own life, to make discoveries about where you yourself stand in all eternity. Obviously, we know where Raphael stands. How long has he been dead? And yet here we are. Go to the next. As well as his scientific discoveries, Cusa the statesman had put forward the principle of the nation state in a series of councils leading up to the Council of Florence. Cusa wrote about the idea of the common good in his Concordatia Catholica, which is exactly what was later adopted, I mean stunningly similar, in the US Declaration of Independence and Constitution. He said that since all men are by nature free, every governance can only come from the agreement and consent of the subjects, because all men are equal in power and equally free the ruler and ruled are equal. Talk about revolutionary. He talks about the very first principle being to secure what is necessary to sustain human life. That men have been endowed with reason which distinguishes them from animals. That there is in the people a divine seed by virtue of their common equal birth. And that the best qualified individuals chosen from all parts of the realm would participate in daily council, representing all the inhabitants of the realm. Representative government. Cousa's <coughs> ideas were being adopted already in the mid 1400s by France and England, in France and England by King Louis XI and Henry VIII. Seven. Henry VII. So a counter deployment was launched against this, against this threat from Venice. In 1517, three years before Raphael died, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses calling for reform of the Catholic Church to the door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany. Luther was indoctrinated by Venetian philosophy and this was the beginning of Protestantism through the Reformation, a group promoting the reform of the Catholic Church. Enter Cardinal Gasparo Contarini a priest from a leading Venetian family, the ancient noble house of Contarini. He stoked up the Reformation, then pushed the counter-Reformation. Beginning with the, he, he began the organising process for the Council of Trent by writing a letter on church reform, praising Aristotle and condemning Erasmus. You can see where the British got their idea of playing both sides. Contarini, who believed that God and his judgments were entirely incomprehensible and preached the inadequacy of the intellect, led an attack against Pope Pius II, who was Nicholas of Cusa's great friend. Contarini and his mates charged that the church was tending toward tyranny. Contarini also coordinated an attack on Cusa's ideas from the intellectual centre of Venetian operations, the University of Padua. The Venetian spy master, Francesco Zorzi, 
was a key part of this leadership grouping. He was the resident theologian and preacher of St. Mark's. He initiated an attack on Nicholas of Cusa with his 1525 De Harmonia Mundi prior to the Council of Trent. And this book, De Harmonia Mundi, basically laid out all these mystic rituals through which you could experience God with the senses. So really an attack on Cusa, as we'll see in a minute. Together, Conti and Zorzi laid the basis for bloody religious warfare that would not end until the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Now, the Council of Trent, which was actually a series of councils beginning in 1545, represented the beginning of the Counter-Reformation. The Catholic Church, responding to the attacks upon it, passed a series of decrees, reforms and doctrinal changes regarding things like the sacraments, sainthoods, indulgences, etc. Decrees concerning sacred music and religious art were passed, including, for example, that there be nothing seen that is disorderly or that is unbecomingly or confusedly arranged, nothing that is profane, nothing indecorous that no one be allowed to place or cause to be placed any unusual image in any place or church, howsoever exempted, except that image have been approved of by the bishop. If anyone shall teach or entertain sentiments contrary to these decrees, let him be anathema. The Inquisition was set up by 1542, uh, in 1542 by Pope Paul III to defend the integrity of the faith. Galileo was to be the most famous trial. The Venetian artist Paolo Veronese was summoned before the Inquisition because his last supper, and you can go to the next one to show the detail, some of the detail, uh, quote, contained buffoons, drunken Germans, dwarfs and other such scurrilities and was extravagant in its costumes and settings. He was given three months to change it, but because he was a Venetian and the Inquisition was partly controlled by Venice, he got away with just renaming it the Feast at the House of Levi. Michelangelo's The Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel came under persistent attack for nudity, not showing Christ seated or bearded, and including a pagan figure. So there were all these rules, and most artists made their living with commissions from the church. So most art was affected by the new decrees. Through rules and formalities, a prohibition of anything different or fresh, any irony or humour was made. The Council of Trent attempted to impose a raft of lies, including that the Renaissance was for Italy only and that the Renaissance is nothing more than a return to the values of ancient Rome, which is the centre and essence of all civilisation. They tried to hem in the Renaissance with these mechanisms and they failed. And this is where Paolo Sarpi comes in. Sarpi was a part of an inner elite which trained as a priesthood in Venice. He was the state theologian of Venice and the leading intellect of the Morosini Salon sponsored by the Morosini and Contarini families. The Morosini Salon met for discussions in the palace of the Morosini family on the Grand Canal. Sarpi led the Salon's campaign to outlaw universal physical principles, as Robbie was saying yesterday. Now the basis for most of Sarpi's ideas came from William of Ockham, who lived 1288 to 1348, but he himself adopted his method from a guy called Averroes, who lived 1126 to 1198, who was an Arab Gnostic interpreter of Aristotle. That was his claim to fame. Occam was an advocate of nominalism. Now, nominalism means that universals, that is, universal physical principles, are only figments of the mind, mere names. Nominalism meaning names. Only objects known by sense certainty have actual existence. Averroes promoted, on the other hand, which was really the same, a doctrine of two truths. One truth was that of religion, 
and the other was that of philosophy or natural science. Now the way this system worked was that anything that couldn't be proven by philosophy or science fell in the category of the first truth, a truth of religion, which means you had to accept it on blind faith. So that category tells you nothing about truth. And since philosophy and natural science, the second category, is defined by nominalism, we only believe in objects, then that tells you nothing either. So really it's the doctrine of no truth. Ockham himself was an earlier Venetian agent deployed against St Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s. Ockhamites believe that the human soul is mortal as it exists only as an object of the senses, it also dies with the senses. Sarpi put Occam's nominalism into a mathematical form. <coughs> Aristotelianism had been absolutely devastated by Cusa and his friends and the Council of Trent, as we said, was an attempt to reassert that Aristotelianism and put down the ideas of the Renaissance. This was a colossal failure and resulted in the Venetians splitting into two factions. Those who wanted to continue the Aristotelian approach, doomed to fail, and those on the other hand who were willing to compromise and innovate their methods in order to keep their control. The first, the old faction was the Vecchi, Italian for old, and the new faction was the Giovanni, Italian for youthful. The mastermind and leader of the Giovanni faction was Paolo Sarpi. In addition to Cusa's introduction of knowable scientific principles and statecraft, the Republican statesman and strategist Niccolo Machiavelli elaborated the strategic and military ideas of Leonardo da Vinci. So apart from the fact that the Venetians were surrounded in their own territory by an explosion of ideas and culture, they were also becoming threatened militarily. You can show the next graphic. This forced a shift to the north led by Sarpi to the Netherlands and, and England to build new financial and maritime bastions. This is just showing some of the military devices of Leonardo da Vinci, a tank, machine gun in the top picture, bottom left, um, a um, slingshot thing, what do you call those things? Catapult. <laughs> Um, so he was basically taking some of Machiavelli's ideas, elaborating, I mean this was a whole political conspiracy like we're engaged in today to oust the Venetians. Sarpi's new philosophy outlawed universal physical principles and launched a new movement based on empiricism which we now know as liberalism. As opposed to the old approach of Aristotle which suppressed any progress or advancement altogether knowing what it would lead to, knowledgeable citizens, an upshift in culture, nation states, etc. Sarpi allowed technological progress, he knew that horse had already bolted, but absolutely no discovery of the principles behind that technological progress. So as the Giovanni became dominant, the new policy was to allow advancements but without ever allowing the method of their discovery to be mastered. When great discoveries were made, they were quickly picked up by one of Sarpi's stooges from Galileo to Descartes to Newton and reduced to flat, boring mathematical formulas. Now Sarpi also attacked the idea of the infinitesimal in Cusa's works. Cusa demonstrated that man can discover the principles behind the way the universe acts and thus act to change the universe. Sarpi set out to decimate this idea. First, Sarpi defined the nature of the universe and the nature of actions of bodies in the universe as reduced merely to the sensual depiction of the bodies themselves, i.e. the fact that they can be described with length, depth and breadth and that they moved around in certain ways. And as I read this next quote, think about what we talked about at the very beginning, how to get across the room, you know, if you linearly divide things up because it's, it's exactly the same. In the words of his biographer, this is the words of a biographer, Sarf, Sarpi argued that 
The matter of natural things is nothing else than extended body, understood as being what persists through transformations and never ceases to be. The body is indefinite extension, which, delimited by surface, line and point, assumes a shape. It constitutes of itself an infinite and unordered continuum upon which infinite orderings and infinite figures may impress themselves. Universals have no existence whatsoever. What do exist are bodies, extended and shaped, which determine and cut into matter so as to make up individual objects which man may perceive through external, passive senses and match to one another depending upon how they resemble one another thanks to an active and internal sense. Now with all matter conceived of as mere extension, any investigation of the universe came down to pure sense perception, of course. Principles were replaced with, quote, the arrangement of matter and so-called laws, which were merely laws of the descriptive effects of an action, that is, descriptive formulas which could mechanically extrapolate future, quote, future events based upon constant repetition of events past. Statistical knowledge based on repetition of sense experiences. Sound like the proof of global warming? <laughs> Sarpy wrote cynically, essence and universality are works of the mind. That is, they are purely imaginary fantasies of the mind. The wise man, wrote Sarpy, recognises that his efforts at obtaining knowledge always come up against the infinite. And knowing that this is beyond his grasp, he stops and comes to no final decision on any matter, deciding to live according to the day-to-day -day appearance of things and in public support those beliefs which are commonly held. Those are Sarpy's words. Thus, Sarpy attacked the idea of being oriented to and changing the future. He says, quote, Do not follow opinion that wears the title of truth, but rather opinion that wears the title of pleasure or usefulness. And, quote, The end of man, as of every other living creature, is to live, simply live in the here and now. Now, one of Sarpy's leading enemies during his lifetime was Kepler. Sarpy and his Giovanni faction created, sponsored and funded Galileo's entire career. They used him to plagiarise and dumb down Kepler's basic discoveries about the solar system. Sarpy and his followers went on to create Descartes as well. Sarpy tutored Francis Bacon and Thomas Hobbes, creating a school of empiricists. Just as a quick example, Descartes' philosophy was straight from Sarpy. He asserted that there are no principles of physics. Next graphic. I know of no kind of material substance other than that which can be divided, shaped and moved in every possible way. And there is absolutely nothing to investigate about this substance except for those divisions, shapes and movements. And that nothing concerning these can be accepted as true unless it is considered as a mathematical demonstration. And because all natural phenomena can thus be explained, I think that no other principles of physics should be accepted or even desired. Now, subject of another class, but Leibniz wiped the floor with Descartes with his dynamics, a science of causes showing that there are invisible principles which organise matter. Leibniz was directly attacking Sarpi's system. Now, in empiricism, Sarpi led an attack with his empiricism on Christianity itself. And, and empiricism was created as a specifically anti-Christian doctrine. The basis for all of Kuz's breakthroughs in understanding the nature of the universe came from his background in Christian theology and in particular, an understanding of the nature of God. But to Kuza, there were no mysteries surrounding God. We were able to know his existence with scientific certainty. Kuza also made scientifically clear the notion of the Trinity, or the Filioque, meaning the Son in Latin, which idea was central to bringing together the Eastern and Western churches at the Council of Florence. 
the existence and role of Christ created a concrete link between God and man, an understanding of which was a key factor in unleashing the golden renaissance. Now to clarify, this trinity is a single God, but in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, otherwise known as the word or logos in Greek, meaning specifically the creative aspect of God, and thirdly, God the Holy Spirit, love or agape in Greek. The word is incarnate in the historical person of Jesus Christ. Kuzer emphasised that the godlike quality of creativity, the son or the word, exists inherently within man. He said, quote, the word of God is within the intellect which need not search outside itself for it will find the word within, unquote. He devoted many of his writings to making clear that the mastery of creativity is an entirely willful, knowable process. In contrast, Sarpi's circles did not believe in the Trinity, but merely in a single dictator like God, and man has nothing of the divine in him. LaRouche has charged that the Venetians created empiricism as a specifically satanic religious doctrine. Sarpi in his private writings held that Christianity was subversive of the established social order, of Venice that is, in particular because of its belief in the immortality of the human soul, because it emphasises the future, whereas man's purpose like animals is merely to live. In his book, The Art of Thinking Well, Sarpi lists the immortality of the soul as one of several, quote, illusory and unproven hypotheses, unquote, along with free will and, quote, the idea that he who knows be more perfect than he who knows not, unquote. <laughs> These three errors, he said, quote, derive from the increase of man's mastery over nature, unquote typified by the golden renaissance that he was surrounded by. Sarpi wrote that the soul was merely a temporary form of organisation of matter. <laughs> and when that matter, the body, died, so did the soul. Sarpi hated Christ. He particularly hated the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth, etc. Because it proposed a code of moral conduct or universal principles for all mankind. On the contrary, he said, quote, do not do to others what you would not have done to you cannot be a good principle because it leads to countless absurdities due to caprice. If you understand it in absolute terms, it goes against nature as preserving oneself is impossible without destroying others, <laughs> unquote. <laughs> as there is no such thing as universal truth, and all we can have are opinions, Sarpi advocated a pantheon of all kinds of religions, whether they were truthful or not, all to be controlled by the state, of course, that is Venice. The basis for manipulations and religious wars. Contrary to Kuz's philosophy, Sarpi does not allow for any such thing as a metaphysical cause a non-physical, externally bounding cause, like Kuz's circle metaphor depicts. No wonder there is none of the divine in his view of man, i.e. God as a cause of us. So Sarpi and his fellow priests undermined Kuz's method and unleashed a stable of empiricists, mathematicians, from Galileo to Newton to set a new dynamic. Now, as an Italian artist, if your bread wasn't buttered by the church, one of the only other alternatives was the Venetian patriarchy. And this next picture, uh, this is the next picture, is the Venetian Senate chamber. Th look, every room in this massive palace, this is the Doge's palace in Venice, is like that. The walls, the ceilings, ornate, gilt-edged, and just filled with paintings like this next one. Um, this one, this is, uh, it's amazing. All of these leading Venetians, they thought so much of themselves. <laughs> they had themselves painted. You know, here's two doges, Doge Pietro Lando and Marcantonio Trevisan, being painted honouring the dead Christ. 
and you find this everywhere through the Venetian art where you know you've got um, a, a, pa a painting of Mary being um, visited by the angel and there's the doge in the background watching you know it's just incredible um, so that the doge's palace is filled with this kind of thing that also even not just the doges but the leading families of Venice you would go to their palaces on the canals and again they would have themselves glorified painted as the gods of Olympus as Apollo depicted in various fashions um, now, what I'm going to do, just looking at some of this Venetian art, is sp I'm splitting it into two periods because you've got the period um, before Raphael died, which, um, and, well, okay, I'll go into that in a bit more detail, but before Rath Raphael died was different to the period after Raphael died. You'll see why. So I'll just show you here um, some of the artists that we'll look at in the first section. Titian, who's fairly well known as a a leading Venetian artist. Next, Giovanni Bellini. We have Giorgione, I think, next. Giorgione, um, Correggio. Uh, I think that's all we've got there. Um, now, the Venetian artists of this period, the mid-1400s until the mid-1500s, existed under the dynamic of the Renaissance. It was prevalent. And its rapidly increasing series of breakthroughs and discoveries regarding perspective, painting and art in general therefore had an unavoidable effect on all the art of the era. So I'll show you a few examples. Um, Bellini, you see, you know, it's not horrific, right? It's not bad because it's dominated by that general, keep going, um, by that general period. So we'll keep going through these. Um, I mean, I will have some things to say about these later because in, like in this one and the next one, you sort of see, or maybe it was the last one. Just go back for a sec. Yeah, this one, you know, you get this kind of disconnection. <laughs> and looking at a lot, of the, a, lot, a lot of this Venetian art, you sort of see this disconnection, like you've got this one guy standing on the left and he's kind of looking over and then this woman feeding a baby on the right and seen in the background. And it's not like we looked at the album Madonna and you've got this communication that's so obviously going on between the figures. And the next one you sort of see that as well. Oh, uh, no, sorry, the previous one. Just go back to, yeah, that one as well. Okay, you can keep, keep going forward now. Um, Correggio, this guy was quite influenced by Leonardo da Vinci, which you can, you can see that. Keep going. Correggio again. Next. Okay, so just put this up to show on the left you've got the Venetian school and on the right the Florentines. Uh, and you see after those four artists I went through, Bellini, Titian, Giorgione, Correggio, that's when the Council of Trent occurred and which failed and then Sarpi came in. Um, but also over here you see it was this period, the Council of Trent Sarpi was right after Raphael's death basically. So you had this whole series of great artists that were the friends of Cusa and then this intervention. And what you will see in this period following Sarpi's intervention uh, was a very stark degeneration in the art of the period. So I'll go through few of those. Okay, this is Tintoretto. Oh, these are the artists. Okay, this is Tintoretto. Next one is Paolo Veronese. Uh, Caravaggio. Horrible guy. <laughs> and Canaletto. Now, some of their art, you will see. I mean, oh, look at this. Compare this to Leonardo's Last Supper. It's so busy, it's dark, it's ugly. The, the focus is not on Jesus at all. You kind of have to think, who, which one's Jesus? And it's only because he's got the bright light around his head that you fig... Yeah. And you've got these kind of spirit figures up in the ceiling area. I don't know if they're angels or what. Look like they could be demons. You've got the lady doing dishes down on the right-hand corner. 
<laughs> Go to the next one. <clears throat> this is, again, Tintoretto. Uh, you know, there's a story about how they brought, the Venetians brought St. Mark's bones to, uh, to St. Mark's Square, named it after him, and Gabby might talk a little bit more about that, I'm not sure. Um, but this is a depiction of that. Look at the sky. Black clouds and red sky, lightning. Um, keep going. The Rape of Europa. Um, this is Veronese. Uh, he painted a lot of the paintings in the Doge's Palace. So he was, you know, these guys were paid, completely owned by the Venetian patriarchs and the Doges, etc. But you really see the romantic influence in this one, you know, the flowery kind of setting, etc. Keep going. Um, this is the Triumph of Venice by Veronese in the Council of Ten on the Council of Ten ceiling. Uh, there's a detail of it, but you know, generally, um, you know, praising Venice, putting Venice in this high, highest regard. Show the next one. You see the kind of crowning that's going on there in the top of that painting. Next, uh, this another similar one. Juno pouring forth her treasure on Venice. It was just all about glorifying Venice. Keep going. Okay, this is Caravaggio, and he's, I reckon he's, he's one of the worst. He, he has all these paintings, basically, of this same guy, which I think is partly um, self-portrait, basically. But, you know, you can look at the muscular work on the shoulders. He's painting them in a, you know, sort of a sexualised way, basically. Um, the next one's even more disgusting because it's a young, thick Bacchus. And, of course, Bacchus was one of the gods along with Apollo and... Um, these other guys that Gabby will talk more about. Um, I've got a... Um, Matt found a picture of in an old art book of Sir Zelman Cowan basically Googling at this big picture of uh, a Caravaggio. It's, it's another Bacchus, it's not the sick Bacchus, but um, just happened to be a picture that was in the back of this art book, <laughs> um, which is pretty funny. Um, OK, keep going. Uh, this is another Caravaggio supper at Emmaus. Next one. Uh, look at the graphic detail in this one. You know, slicing through. It, it's not even kind of realistic where you see the blood spurting. It's, it's just kind of like the video games that you see. <laughs> the blood spurts out when you yeah. kill the guy in the video game. Next. Um, okay, this is The Death of the Virgin by Caravaggio. Now, this, uh, Mar this figure of Mary lying down, uh, he modelled his picture of Mary on a very famous prostitute. And he regularly did this. And he deliberately did it to be provocative. He would take, he would go and find, you know, prostitutes and use them as his models to depict Mary or other, you know, religious figures. Uh, the next one. This is how he depicted John the Baptist. <laughs> Com compare that to what we saw in the Elba Madonna. I mean, he's still, you can see he's compared him as a shepherd with the goat, but sexualise it again. Um, next one. Um, yeah, Madonna and child with Saint Anne. Now, first of all, Madonna wearing the red dress, you know, he's drawn her with cleavage and everything. <laughs> Saint Anne, he's drawn as this half-dead old woman who was not like that and then Christ with this snake this kind of imagery between the the naked Christ and the snake <laughs> it's pretty horrific but compare it to the next one which I showed earlier you know of the dignity of that depiction of exactly the same scene and in fact if you flick between you see the um, just the last yeah see the Christ child moving away from Mary in the direction of Anne it's the same next one again sort of the same motion. He's moving to John the Baptist in that case, but completely different depiction. Um, okay, show a few more of the, I think, Canalettos. Now, uh, I'll talk a bit more about Canaletto in a minute. I think just run through them. The, this is Canaletto. Now, you see a completely different style of painting coming in here. Keep going. I think the last one is the Thames one. Yeah, so stop there. Now, 
We're going to hone in on Canaletto a bit because he was one of the more famous of a new school of view painters. You know, so they were painting a view. But first, just a little bit of background on Canaletto. Um, Antonio Conti, I think there's a graphic of him actually. He's pretty ugly. You might not want to leave it up for too long. <laughs> Oh, I can't look at that for very long. I'm glad I'm looking this way. <laughs> he was another priest and Venetian nobleman who took up, he took up where Sarpi left off. He was part of Sarpi's group in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Um, Conti is the guy who organised the campaign to discredit Leibniz using Newton, who he turned into a scientist, but who was actually just a plagiarist and master of the royal mint. Leibniz was not only a massive threat to their established theories of empiricism, he was threatening to become a key political leader, potentially the next Prime Minister of England, the Empire's new bastion. So he was the Privy Councillor to the Electress Sophie of Hanover, the granddaughter of James I, who was next in line for the British throne, throne in the early 1700s. Now, even though Conti's critical role is beyond the scope of this class, it's important to mention him because he played a very specific role in this post-Renaissance <coughs> art world. He was a key figure in a Venetian salon which organised the school of romanticism in the classical arts. His salon included Gianmaria Ortez, who Robbie spoke about yesterday, who was the first guy to give the world... Oh, was it <coughs> Robbie or Craig? Maybe it was Craig. Um, he was the first to give the world a fixed carrying capacity, so he was the popu population fanatic. And another guy called Francesco Algarotti. Amongst other things, Algarotti wrote Newtonian Science for Ladies. <laughs> this was a, a key way of spreading Newton's <coughs> garbage everywhere. <laughs> yeah, the dummies are for dummies, yeah. For ladies, hey, what are you calling us? <laughs> <laughs> the Salon also included Her Majesty's British Consul at the time, a guy called Joseph Smith, and there'll be more to come on him later as well, but he was a, in previous classes, I mean future classes, he was a merchant, a banker and an art dealer and patron. He became the patron and controller of this guy Canaletto and other Venetian artists. Under Smith's control, Canaletto became a virtual experiment for the Conti Salon, fulfilling the ideas of Smith and Conti, who were literally reducing art to the equivalent of a photograph, or in fact worse. You see that in these examples. In turn, Smith was a crucial conduit for the importation of Venetian culture into Britain in this period. Conti wrote a book on aesthetics which was basically all about how art merely imitates what we see, full on empiricism and sense perception. In his book he says that the purpose of art is, quote, to represent in some way things which would make upon the sensory organs and the soul impressions similar to those which the things themselves would have made. So, you know, an orange makes a certain sense impression on you. My painting of an orange is going to make the same sense impression on you. <laughs> That's his idea of art. Um, I'm going to show you four, there's a few more, oh, is that the next one? Yep. Um, there's f go through the next four, or the next three following this one as I'm talking. In this way, art was deprived of idea content. It may have looked good, but it was devoid of any real ideas or irony. This is Sarpi's method, no principles allowed. One article I read on the Venetian school described it as having a focus on the sensual surface of things and stated that the purpose of painting is to create a mood, not tell a story. In contrast, Leonardo da Vinci said that the primary purpose of painting is to communicate ideas. To do that, he said you must develop the tools and knowledge required by painting. 
Example, anatomy, botany, geology, physiology, mechanics, hydraulics, engineering, astronomy. He did it all. He studied them all so that he could paint what he was, what it was he was going to represent. He, he, you know, cut open bodies so that he could draw the human body. Um, the painter who draws merely by practice and by eye without any reason is like a mirror which copies everything placed in front of it without being conscious of their existence, da Vinci said. Caravaggio and Canaletto both made use of the camera obscura, whereby you set up a large box with a pinhole in one side. This was actually the first type of camera. And trace a projection made by the light going through that pinhole onto the back wall of the box. And so they would put their paper up and they would trace what was there. And they took these, these out with them. They did that and they took their tracing back to the studio and then they painted. Leonardo describes the use of such tools as the camera obscura or vertical tracing devices as reprehensible in whoever cannot portray without them nor use his own mind in analyses because through such laziness he destroys his own intelligence. Men like this will always be poor and weak in imaginative work or historical composition which is the aim of this science. Leonardo also criticises artists who do not carry out detailed investigations to understand the nature of light and vision. He believed that the purpose of science and art is to develop ways to educate the layman of the eternal metaphysical truths that underlie the nature of the universe. Probably the most crucial thing about view painting, however, and the most noticeable, is that it deliberately took human beings out of the picture entirely except some, some, sometimes, as you see here, as little stick figures. And in fact, Canaletto, you know, read about his methods and everything, and he, he had the same way of drawing, you know, the stick figures. He had this whole method worked out to show the drapery and the clothing, and he just did the same ones in every painting. Um, and, you know, so you're left with nothing to denote the functioning of the human mind or expression of human emotion. When you compare these artists to their immediate predecessor Rembrandt in the next graphic, for example, this is very stark. As you see in the Rembrandts, the human emotion, you know, the, the thoughts, the processes being conveyed. But even in a lot of the earlier, somewhat better Venetian art, you notice a lack of eye contact and a lack of communication between the people depicted. Now the view painters were trying to make their paintings look exactly like what they saw with the senses. You can go through those three. An empirical reflection. But Conti wanted to push art even further in the direction of untruthfulness. <laughs> to Conti, truth was irrelevant. He began to push the idea of fantasy in art. And Joseph Smith pushed Canaletto to move in this direction, painting what they called the fantasy view, or veduta ideata. <laughs> Meaning ideal view. They were visibly or sensually representing something perfect, something fantastical, something ideal, purified of every defect in their words, rather than provoking people to see an actual idea. Romanticism. They eliminated the element of irony or paradox that emerges when you attempt to represent the world truthfully. Textbooks on this neoclassical shift in art were published by <coughs> Joseph Smith's publishing house in Venice and spread. Conti brought Newton's ideas and experiments, even scientific instruments. Remember when he was in England, Conti was meeting with Newton. He had dinner with him three times a week. And after his first trip to visit Newton, he brought back his scientific instruments on the science of light, the spectrum, optics, etc., into Venice to share with his stable of artists and with his friend Joseph Smith, who used his printing house to publish and promote Newton's writings the um, Newtonian Science for Ladies that was printed by Joseph Smith's printing house. So there was a whole conduit line there. Um, around this time though, you'll see in the next picture, when Conti brought these devices of Newtons in, um, you know, in the art world they described this incredible shift in Canaletto's paintings regarding the use of light and colour. He supposedly developed this mastery of light and you see, these are just a few examples of the dark ones before that period. And then the next shot, 
you can see what they're talking about in the next shot. The light, yeah. So, but, you know, compare that to Rembrandt, because Rembrandt was before this. You look at Rembrandt's mastery of light, I mean, okay, he's got last, less dark shadows and a bit more colour, but, you know, there, there's nothing there. So this is how the Venetians ran a concerted campaign to destroy creativity via the eradication of metaphor and irony or the infinitesimal in art. Art is a means to reveal the truth to a broad audience. The universe presents to us paradoxes such that our minds are provoked to discover truth beyond what appears to our senses. If you want to represent truth in art, you should do that too. Do what the universe does. Ideas are provoked in the viewer through irony, the singularity created by two contrasting ideas. Ontologically, that singularity is of the same type as the singularity created by the infinitesimal, the shadow of a physical principle, remember, that we went through at the beginning. So the exact same method which characterises good science characterises good art. In the same way that the universe is composed entirely of principles, so too is good art. When you strip away the surface sense perceptual aspect, what are you left with? Principles. Like Sky said in the clip that we played earlier on, when you go so small into the subatomic domain that there is no matter left, all that remains are principles. Those principles presented as truthful ideas are the basis of beauty. It is not superficial, it is not empirical. In conclusion, let's look again at the School of Athens. So we'll go to the next one. Now, um, okay, go to the next one, just to I mean, everyone's probably seen this before and knows maybe something about it, a little about it. Here we have Plato on the left and Aristotle on the right, which is the centrepiece and certainly the focal point of where your eye is drawn in the painting. Um, Plato is holding a copy of the Timaeus, which uh, goes through a lot about universal principles and harmonics that order the universe. He talks a lot about particularly the, the heavens, the astronomical domain. He's pointing upward. You have Aristotle who's pointing downward and he's holding a copy of his ethics which is um, more about the physical world. He's got a lot in his ethics about social principles, things like friendship. You know, it kind of goes on and on getting dragged amongst the mud of how do you organise social relations whereas Plato is indicating to the higher bounding principles that transform social relations when you see this kind of art and these ideas being uh, presented to the populace. Um, so that's kind of the central metaphor, the contrast between the method of Aristotle and Plato. You know, Plato is along the lines of the Renaissance, Aristotle was what was prior to that. We'll go to the next picture, I'll just go through a few very quickly of the people in this painting. We've got Aeschines and Socrates there in dialogue. In the next one you have Averroes. Remember this was the guy that Paolo Sarpi took a lot of his ideas from. The guy that had the idea of two truths. Um, so, you know, not such a great guy but he's in the painting. The next one, <coughs> Epicurus, another not so great guy. He, Sarpi got a lot of his ideas from Epicurus. Maybe Gabby will talk about him more but Okay, no. <laughs> he, was, he was a pro-pagan philosopher of ancient Greece who believed the purpose of life is to simply live and that seeking pleasure and avoiding pain is all that life is about. So Sarpi specifically took that notion of his, which was the centre of his philosophy, from this guy Epicurus. Um, you hear Epicurean um, as a sort of a adjective to describe, particularly people who like enjoying food or enjoying sensual things. Next one, uh, you've got Archimedes who's the one drawing on the slate and a group around him. Next one, 
Ptolemy is the one with his back turned. You've got uh, on the left holding a sphere of the heavens, Zoroaster. You've got Raphael, the um, one who's looking out, looking at us, making eye t contact with the second from the right. Next one, Heraclitus, um, who was drawn as Michelangelo, philosopher Heraclitus, next one. Parmenides, another philosopher from ancient Greece, next one. Pythagoras, another. Next one, I'm not going through all of them, but Zeno of Citium, just to give you a bit of an idea of who he's put into this school of figures. Next. Okay, so on one level, you have various goodies and baddies all on the stage of history. You've got good philosophers, bad philosophers, etc. People from many different times, from a span of a thousand years or so. But on another level, Raphael seems to be presenting us a scene where all mankind is good. All the players are engaged in thinking, ideas, collaboration, solving problems, <coughs> running across the room to deliver a message, reading, writing, dialoguing, listening. If you have a close look at this sometime over the weekend, you'll see you know, that there's activity, there's motion in every single part of this painting. The beauty and motion of the overall scene, in distinction to the otherwise crucial polemic that Raphael has at the centrepiece of Plato versus Aristotle and their scientific method, conveys the idea that all men are in the image of God, all men are creative, and that that force will ultimately win the day. That idea will prevail across eternity. As if to say to the Pope of the day who made Raphael paint over the work of Piero della Francesca, one of the earlier Renaissance geniuses, you may control the politics of the day, but that is merely transitory compared to the long arc of history over which only truthful or immortal ideas and people will prevail. This is the ultimate irony. In a painting in which Raphael had to visibly present certain politically correct ideas because he was, that was his commission, he yet presented actual truth, nowhere visible to the eye, only to the mind, beneath the surface, like the music between the notes, thus proving the superiority of this Renaissance method. Classical art mimics the universe and its principles by taking a bunch of singularities in the sensible domain and making sense of them, by revealing the coherence between those seemingly discontinuous or separate elements. It gives unity or causality as a unifying principle. It forms a universal. No wonder Sarpi hated the Renaissance. As LaRouche once put it, the principle of irony radiates as a dynamic. This is the manifestation of great classical art, a process which is unleashed in society as by Leonardo da Vinci, which radiates, is transmitted, which acts in a dynamic way. In this way, creativity is an efficient force. The prevailing cultural dynamic, good or bad, determines the society. But a creative dynamic is infinitely more powerful. It resonates with the universe. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, um, how do we recognise a um, the infinitesimal in things like agape? How do we know that's that's a um, universal truth? What, what process do we discover and know that? The infinitesimal in something like agape. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, think about it in terms of agape as a universal principle. Um, you can express agape in a million different ways, yeah. but it's universally still agape. I mean, you could be... Feel it to be universal and believe it. Yeah. Nice, but someone else like Carlos Arte saying that they should be universal. 
Mm -hmm. How do you know which one's right? Or how? Yeah. Well, look at the effect of it. <laughs> yeah. Look at yeah. the look at the effect of what Sarpi did. Yeah. Um, you know the the period after the period of the religious wars from 1618 to 1648. Yeah. Until the Treaty of Westphalia ended that, and then even then it continued afterwards, and the history of the British Empire since then. Yeah. Adam Smith, his ideas. Um, you know, the, the moral theory of moral sentiments where he talks about, um, you know, the famous quote that Lynn uses all the time that we, I don't know if anyone can think of it exactly in the words, he talks about, you know, we have to follow our, um, uh, you know, if we, it's basically the idea of, um, um, pursue you can never yeah, pursue pleasure. Yeah, you can never be responsible for your country or whatever like that. Yeah, you just have to do what you want to do. Yeah and that will result in the best possible good in the end, somehow, mysteriously. Um, On so visible hand, is that it? Yeah, 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 exactly. Something is just going to make everything right. The, the fable of the bee's mandible is what I was thinking of. Um, it's that idea, you know. So it's the same idea that Sarpi, Sarpi was saying yeah. much later. So the whole British Empire, this, you know, today is the result of that. So. Yeah, you can see the direct consequences of those ideas as opposed to the legacy of the Renaissance, which you can also see to this day that legacy, can't you? Because everything good that man has done, where we have made discovery, you know, even though Sarpi has tried to take discoveries and they're trying to rip them apart even today, shutting down NASA, etc. Um, but nonetheless, we have made in going to the moon and doing other things, crucial advancements, even despite the oligarchy's attempt to suppress that. I mean, you know, they're really the ones with the hard job because it's natural for people to think creatively and to discover the universe from a little child. You've got that intention to want to figure things out. Um, so for them to suppress that, that's, that's a really big job. And right now we're at a political moment where people are really beginning to ask questions and um, they have to do something dramatic to try to stop the expression of that, the mass strike, being gripped by a dynamic like that of the Renaissance. And, you know, we here today, LaRouche, all of our colleagues around the world, we have an efficient machine as good as what Cusa and these guys were doing. I mean, Lynn has built upon what Cusa did, what Leibniz did, what Riemann did, so we've got even probably a greater capacity <coughs> today to, if we think in the realm of setting a dynamic amongst the mass strike, not, not thinking about, okay, I've got to organise and convince individuals, because in the same way that Sky said that um, cosmic radiation is not composed of particles, a mass strike is not primarily composed of individuals. You're still going to get people that have woken up that are a part of a mass strike movement that are at a town hall meeting or out on the street or something. They have no idea what, <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, they've woken up, but they're still confused by brainwashing of decades. So don't expect suddenly, you know, don't, don't complain to us, oh, I can't organise anyone. You're talking about this mass strike doesn't exist. These people know nothing. Don't complain about that. Of course they don't know nothing. We have to educate them. We have to set the dynamic. But we can't act upon the individuals. We can't act upon the particles. We have to act upon the entire field. And it's only principled leadership coming from us, putting forward principles. You organise the physical universe, right? The ordering principle, like the circle bounding the polygon. So if principles organise the physical universe, our principled leadership putting truth forward is going to organise the field and set a dynamic amongst the mass strike. And that's how we have to be thinking. Um, and that's how you unleash agape, really, because, and sometimes you might have to, <laughs> sometimes agape, agape might be ripping into someone about their axioms. You say, oh, that's not agape. <laughs> 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 of course it is. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, the alternative's genocide, yeah. <laughs> um, if, you, if you want to study the um, Renaissance painters, what are some of the better books you can recommend? Oh, look, start with Fidelio. Um, I'm not sure what's out there on the tables, but... Um, 
Okay, yeah, have a look through some of the Fidelios and find, like, I think Winter 93, there's, oh, there might not be any that old actually, but um, we can get photocopies of certain articles because you can, uh, I, didn't, I didn't look at a lot, I mean I looked at some outside books, but what you generally find is that you'll have good stuff in there, but then you'll have other stuff in there that, you know, because they're art critics and a lot of what we're looking at of the Venetian, um, like that guy Joseph, Joseph Smith I mentioned and his circles, Conti, etc. Um, today's art critics came at, come out of that same school, you know, art critics over the years have come from that school. So, I mean, there's certain things they can't lie about in terms of Leonardo and Raphael. They obviously appreciate them, but they don't put it in no one puts it in the way we put it because they're not looking at it through the same eyes as we are from a political standpoint of this battle across the ages between um, you know the the Sarpies and and the Renaissance figures going back to Plato Aristotle today LaRouche taking on the British Empire none of no one looks at it in that way like we do so you best to start with our writings and then you'll find sources and references but when you go to the original sources you have to take everything with a grain of salt and that's how we've done most of our research that, which is ongoing on this, through this period. Elisa, oh. can we, can we have a bit more on romanticism? I know you've given a few examples, oh. can we discuss it a bit more please? Yeah, I think that's probably the best way to tackle it because I didn't, um, I mean the work I'm doing on, where I mentioned that in relation to the work on Conti and, um, and Joseph Smith. Conti's whole book on aesthetics is actually about poetry. Noel's going to look at poetry this afternoon, but it applies equally to art and other things. Uh, but yeah, I didn't, I haven't extensively gone in that direction and a lot of the work I'm doing is kind of brand new work extending from Venice into England where there's a million unanswered questions and paradoxes and I'm not you know, confident to talk about that in more detail yet, but yeah, Nolene will talk a bit more about and touch on it this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>